One year ago in 2020, large-scale protests broke out across Belarus after the authorities announced an improbable landslide victory for President Alexander Lukashenko. The protest shone a light on widespread dissatisfaction with Lukashenko after five terms in office, but these protests signified more than a response to the brutal attack on a domestic population. Indeed, the situation in Belarus has turned from a domestic to a geopolitical one and has become a security concern for those in the region as well. In addition to the US, UK, and European responses to the protests, the Russian-Belarusian dynamic too has seen shifts and presents challenges but also opportunities to President Lukashenko and President Putin. So what have we learned on the one-year anniversary of the protests in Belarus? Here with me today is Nigel Gold Davis, IISS Senior Fellow for Russia and Eurasia and the editor of the IISS Strategic Survey. From 2000 to 2010, he served in the UK's Foreign and Commonwealth Office, including as ambassador to Belarus from 2007 to 2009. He later held senior government relations roles in the energy industry. Welcome back onto the show, Nigel. Thank you, Matt. It's very good to see you. Nigel, to start off, you've written in some of your coverage on the topic of the Belarusian protests that Lukashenko's election in 1994 was the last free and fair election in Belarus's recent history. So what has changed in 2020 for the protests to become so widespread? The developments in Belarus over the past year have been very significant, not only for Belarus, but for Europe, Russia, and beyond. Um, to start with the question of why they happened. So there are a number of causes converged uh, last August to produce the unprecedented uh, upsurge of uh, demands of peaceful change that we saw in the streets. Uh, the first, if we look at uh, the long period of Alexander Lukashenko's rule, was the growing dissatisfaction uh, with his increasingly authoritarian system. This is the third longest ruling leader across the entire Eurasian continent. He has been there since 1994. People were tiring of his rule uh, and the gradual erosion of living standards as well as of freedom. The second cause, which really uh, burst forth uh, earlier last year, was his specific response to the COVID-19 pandemic. He was one of those uh, strongmen leaders around the world, certainly not the only one, who responded to this invasion from a virus, not by protecting his people from it, but by deprecating it and minimizing its significance uh, to the extent of uh, offering folk remedies like uh, drinking vodka and driving tractors were still actually insulting those who died from it. It was an astonishing dereliction of duty from someone who has posed as the father, the batka uh, in Belarusian, of his people. And the third and final reason uh, was his... Uh, flagrant falsification of the elections that uh, took place a year ago. Uh, not only did he uh, produce a, a, a fabricated election result showing him as the victor, uh, the extent of his claim of support was uh, just fantastical in nature, 80% uh, or, or, or thereabouts of the vote, uh, sparking indignation uh, an outrage, but that was simply a spark on a bonfire of deeper and longer term causes, which have not gone away. That's the important point here. Uh, the causes of discontent remain just as strong as they were uh, before these protests began. And perhaps an impertinent question, but why are these protests worth discussing one year on? One year on, an enormous amount has changed both in Belarus and in the way that Belarus, under the present regime, is behaving internationally. Uh, this is not only a human rights situation of unprecedented concern, but also increasingly a security issue for countries uh, around Belarus. Uh, and uh, the, it's not just that the human rights situation uh, is uh, bleak. It has long been so in Belarus. But we have seen things that have happened there that really haven't happened in Europe for decades uh, outside of the, the, the civil wars in Yugoslavia. If we look at the, the broad, broader sweep of post-war European history, it's, it's hard to see anything that's as bad as uh, what we've been seeing in uh, Belarus. And what is Lukashenko standing now within the country and its elite? Among the country at large, I think it's fair to say 
he has lost legitimacy, the sense of a right to rule, in the eyes of a large majority of the population. His popularity had been falling before the elections. His brutal response uh, to the protests, uh, harsh, uh, thuggish, uh, involving systematic and meticulous torture, uh, was awful even by the stands of authoritarian regimes. That has turned against him even parts of the population that were inclined to sort of accept more or less passively his rule. He will never regain that legitimacy. In a sense, he's not even trying to. Uh, his only appeal for his population now is really an appeal of force, not of a, a right to uh, rule. Uh, so we are seeing now a, an unpopular uh, leader uh, ruling uh, through uh, sticks, and very harsh sticks at that, rather than carrots. Uh, on the matter of the elite, uh, this is very, very important because I think that the history of uh, change in other countries and other times and places shows that uh, popular discontent is a necessary but not usually a sufficient condition for fundamental change, which is to say you have to see some kind of uh, defection or split within elites as well. If elites remain united and resolved in their determination to maintain the status quo, it's usually hard uh, for even a large uh, groundswell of, uh, of opposition to prevail over that. So watch what elites do. Cultural and sporting elites have already begun to defect from this regime, and that will have been uh, fueled by the, the appalling treatment uh, of Kristina Simonovskaya uh, over the past week, the Belarusian uh, uh, um, uh, sprinter. Uh, there are other elites, of course, uh, on which Lukashenko relies more directly for maintaining rule. Those are the hard men and uh, the structures of oppression uh, that they uh, wield on his behalf. Uh, and uh, he, he feels the need, and he's done so even in the past year, to regularly rotate the leaders uh, of those, uh, of those, uh, those positions, the, uh, the, the interior ministry and so on. And that suggests also that he's aware not only of the importance of their loyalty, but the fact that he cannot take it for granted. What did the grounding of Ryanair Flight 4978, which was diverted to Belarus en route from Athens to Vilnius on the 23rd of May 2021, tell us about Lukashenko's power, despite these movements that you see within the elite circles? It tells us two things. Uh, the first is that although uh, Lukashenko and his enforcers have managed to intimidate most of the uh, protesters off the streets uh, for the moment, that does not mean that they uh, feel confident in their longer-term prospects. This extraordinary and outrageous and internationally illegal act uh, betrays uh, a fundamental uh, sense of weakness, that they had to go to such uh, lengths to detain a single young uh, opposition internet journalist. So it shows us that they do not feel that they are firmly and confidently in control. The second thing it shows is that uh, Belarus's behavior now is escalating from the appalling treatment of its own people to becoming increasingly an international threat and menace, and one that other countries cannot uh, ignore. Belarus is no longer a human rights issue only, it's also a security issue. And we've seen other international events. Again, uh, Ms. Simonovskaya, the, uh, the uh, uh, sprinter is a case in point. Uh, the very troubling and disturbing in suspicious circumstances murder uh, of uh, the, uh, the Belarusian opposition activist. Um, uh, Vitaly Shishov in uh, Kiev is another case in point. So this shows that Belarus, uh, the regime, is now uh, no longer interested in maintaining even the semblance of, of, a, of an effort to uh, retain good relations with the West. It's burning bridges all over the case. And that was never the, never the case before. Well, I remember when I was serving in Belarus, the message there was always, look, we present no harm to anyone else. We uh, uh, only want good relations 
uh, with the West, of course, on Belarus's terms, but they sought a, a beneficial relationship that might soften sanctions, that might lead to economic cooperation, and so on. That narrative is, has now evaporated. There is a systematic uh, hostility and, and contempt for international opinion. But where does this confidence come from within Lukashenko's regime? On the one hand, we see a growing concern of just how strong the regime is internally, whilst on the other hand, there seems to be a complete disregard for how the regime is perceived domestically, regionally, as well as internationally. So what do these two observations tell us? The regime is not confident at all of its prospects, the fact that it's prepared to behave in steadily more uh, outrageous ways. Uh, shows just what a high priority it places on trying to eliminate any trace of, of opposition. In some of the ways you described, but in others too, if we look at what's going on in the country, we now see an unprecedented uh, suppression of civil society and of journalists and so on. The bounds of tolerance are narrowing uh, ever more severely. And again, that's part of the story of the of the Ms. Semenovskaya's uh, case. She was not a political figure. She did not seek out uh, a political role. Her offense in the eyes of the regime was to make a, a purely professional and technical criticism of a decision of her coach. Uh, but that today in Belarus is considered uh, a disloyal act. And again, all of these uh, measures that uh, the regime is taking bespeak a fundamental uh, lack of confidence. They're prepared to sacrifice everything, including any future prospect of a good relationship uh, with the West, uh, in order to eliminate uh, with some urgency, uh, in their eyes, uh, the, uh, the, the opposition uh, uh, forces that, uh, that they see as a threat. You're listening to Sound Strategic with Nigel Gold Davis as our guest today to discuss the one-year anniversary of the 2020 protests in Belarus. Nigel, you mentioned that this conflict has become more geopolitical in nature, so I'd like to turn our discussion to the role of Russia here. You've recently published a fascinating article in the WSS Survival Journal on the relationship between Putin's Russia and Lukashenko's Belarus. So what is Russia's position on these developments, and do you think that we overestimate or perhaps underestimate Russia's influence in Belarus? Uh, I've heard of you in some quarters that uh, there's very little that can change in Belarus and very little that... Uh, uh, Western countries can do to support peaceful and progressive change uh, because Russia is the arbiter of what happens in Belarus. And I think that's a great mistake and a very significant uh, overestimation uh, of uh, Russia's uh, capabilities in all this. And it understates the real dilemmas uh, and difficult choices that Russia faces. On the one hand, Russia sees this situation as an opportunity for itself. It has long sought to turn Belarus's economic dependence on Russia into political leverage uh, that would uh, turn Belarus into an effective satellite, not just economically, but also with respect to military arrangements and basing rights and that sort of thing. This is really the reason why relations between Putin and Lukashenko personally have been so difficult and even toxic in recent years. The two are locked in a, a close but uh, fundamentally dysfunctional uh, embrace. Uh, the irony here is that uh, from the Russian point of view, Lukashenko has provided valuable services that, uh, that Russia should, um, should be very pleased about. It's kept uh, a, a Belarus uh, free from any kind of Western orientation and emphatically undemocratic. If there's uh, an ideal neighbor for Russia, it should have been uh, Belarus under Lukashenko in recent years. And yet, Russia has managed to contrive a very difficult relationship because Russia, uh, under uh, present management, always wants more. Uh, even uh, compliance and a, a good relationship is never, never enough. It won't, won't control. And now Russia sees a situation where uh, Lukashenko is uh, unprecedentedly weakened uh, both with respect to his own population, where he no longer enjoys any significant loyalty, and with respect to the West, more alienated from Western opinion uh, than ever. And a weakened uh, Lukashenko should, in principle, translate into new opportunities 
for Russia to try to exert greater control. That's all on the plus side for Russia. On the minus side is the fact that they uh, worry that change in Belarus, even if it's something that Russia is trying to manage, could spin out of control and turn into something uh, that would lead to a freer and more democratic uh, Belarus uh, and to a Belarus that wants a better relationship with uh, the West. The Belarusian opposition has wisely not tried to make this a geopolitical issue. They have not actively sought a Western uh, orientation. That's not been a part of their messaging. Uh, they have focused entirely on the demands for peaceful democratic change, to be ruled by a leader that they themselves have chosen. Russia, though, has made this a geopolitical issue by making baseless uh, allegations that uh, the, uh, the demonstrations uh, and opposition leaders in Belarus have been funded and supported uh, by the West. Uh, none of that uh, is true. Uh, now, Russia, of course, is a very large uh, neighbor and a very militarily powerful one, uh, and that raises the specter uh, that Russia could simply uh, invade Belarus if it wishes uh, and use that, that, that ultimate sanction of force to, uh, to, to, to clamp down uh, in, in a decisive way. That, in principle, is true, and we should never rule anything out. But that would be uh, a very, very risky strategy for Russia. That would immediately invite uh, even more severe sanctions on Russia itself than those it already uh, faces. Short of that, if it's a matter of Russia trying to influence and shape developments in Belarus without uh, imposing them with tanks and bayonets, well, that's much harder. Belarus is an independent uh, country, it has a population that uh, is, yes, well disposed towards Russia, but culturally uh, different and doesn't wish to be invaded. Uh, an invasion would immediately turn a, a, a essentially pro-Russian population into a violently anti-Russian one. We've seen in the case of Ukraine in 2014 uh, how severely Russia can miscalculate uh, its policies towards its neighbors. So it's really, I think it's, it's watching carefully considering its options, but again, I think it would be a dangerous mistake to assume that Russia will decide what happens in Belarus. And what about the other side of the coin? How does Lukashenko view the relationship between Russia and Belarus, and does it provide him with an opportunity to leverage that relationship for his own interests? It's worth remembering that just before the election a year ago, uh, 34 members of the uh, Russian military intelligence-linked so-called private military company, Wagner Group, were arrested in dramatic circumstances in Minsk. Uh, and that was touted at the time by the authorities as uh, a, an example of Russian, uh, Russia threatening or trying to meddle in uh, Belarus's elections. Uh, despite that, and despite the, the, the earlier history of difficult uh, relations between Putin and Lukashenko, Lukashenko did, at the height of the... Uh, uh, of the, the, uh, the protests uh, that soon followed, appealed to Putin for help and said, I mean, quite explicitly, you've got to stop this things breaking down here. If, uh, if, if Belarus is, uh, becomes democratic, it won't stop there. It will, it will move into Russia as well. So appealing to a fellow authoritarian strongman to offer support. There's really nowhere else Lukashenko can... Uh, turn to at the moment. So he knows that he needs Putin, however much he distrusts Putin's uh, motives. But at the same time, uh, Lukashenko also knows that for Russia, there is no obvious alternative to Lukashenko. Uh, was almost any feasible leader would be less welcome to Putin, at least for the moment. So you're absolutely right. Uh, if we're looking for where strength lies in this relationship, uh, we can say that uh, uh, both parties, uh, Lukashenko and Putin, have strengths and weaknesses. Uh, and uh, to the extent that Lukashenko knows Putin needs to keep him, Lukashenko, in power, then Lukashenko's power remains uh, uh, relatively uh, strong in, in Russia's eyes. Uh, there has been speculation that Russia has been casting around for another candidate to replace Lukashenko. They try to sort of shove him uh, out of the scene somehow and impose on Belarus someone who is both authoritarian, 
like Lukashenko and undemocratic, but also more pro-Russian. Um, it's hard to know what that person would be. That's the first point. The second, more fundamental point, which is really, really important here, is that uh, Belarusian civil society now has reached a point where any future leader of the country, in order to be considered legitimate and to be able to govern peacefully, would need to be democratically chosen. We've long passed the point where uh, populations are simply chess pieces on a board and you can move leaders around to, to govern them unproblematically. Uh, so Russia could not hope to find a leader that would both satisfy it and also satisfy the Belarusian people. Turning to Europe, the European Commission under the leadership of Ursula von der Leyen has stated that it needs to be a geopolitical commission with an ambitious, strategic, and assertive role in global affairs. Now, how do you see the EU's response to the protests last year? And did actions live up to this ambition, do you think? I've been broadly impressed by the extent so far of the international support for the advance of peaceful change. That's the EU and the UK and the United States working together. So particularly challenging in the case of the EU, of course, because uh, sanctions positions need to be uh, agreed unanimously and need to be renewed every six months. This has happened. There have been some hiccups on the way. There was a, a time when uh, discussions of uh, sanctions on Belarus were interrupted by Cyprus because Cyprus wanted EU support uh, on an unrelated issue concerning uh, Turkey, but that was, uh, that was overcome. Uh, I've been very impressed by the, the speed and the emphaticness with which the EU has condemned the actions uh, in, uh, in, in Belarus, successive actions, not only the brutal suppression of, of uh, peaceful protesters, but also, for example, the Ryan Air incident. Uh, so there is a, there is a, a strong view uh, and no real dissenters about the unacceptability of these things. Uh, and then on sanctions matters, uh, the EU has been steadily escalating its, matter, it, its uh, actions uh, and its, uh, its measures. Uh, it's not only sanctions, though, that are important. It's also important to continue to sustain support for civil society, difficult though that is, uh, in the now very repressive uh, situation that Belarus finds itself in. Uh, and it's also worth remembering in all of these matters that uh, there are no quick and immediate solutions. And uh, one of the, uh, I think, the, the, the points to make about sanctions generally, both with respect to uh, Belarus and also to Russia and to other countries as well, it's not like a light switch. You don't just turn them on, wait for a few weeks or months, and then say, well, the fundamental things happen, happened, therefore sanctions don't work. That's, uh, that's really crooked thinking uh, and demands immediate standards of success that we demand of no other policy instrument. So uh, resolution and also strategic patience uh, will continue to be important here. You mentioned that there's support for civil society in Belarus. Can you go into a little bit more detail on how that's enacted? Yes, uh, partly it involves support and uh, including financial help for victims of brutality who have managed to get out of the country in particular, and so therefore it's easy to help them. Uh, there really have been significant numbers of people who have suffered life-changing injuries, uh, both physical and also psychological. So helping and supporting them is important. Uh, Belarusian uh, opposition exile groups, we've had a large exodus uh, of Belarusian uh, uh, activists uh, over the past year. Helping and supporting them uh, is important as well. In addition to that, there's been a very welcome initiative which the UK is also party to that seeks to uh, provide resources to document the human rights abuses that are continuing to take place. And this is very important. If, uh, if, if a real-time meticulous record of violations is kept, uh, including records of those responsible for them, then one day justice can be served. Nigel, if there's one thing that you think our audience should be looking at uh, for the remainder of this year into the near future as to what might change in Belarus uh, with regards to the situation, what would you point them to? 
I think it's very important to understand that there is no stability in Belarus now. We, in no sense have we returned to the, the status quo ante before the elections, even though the protesters have been intimidated and subdued, at least in their open uh, demands for change now. Uh, th there are forces and dynamics at work that c are continuing to drive this uh, situation in unpredictable directions. Uh, another big question now is how much worse the behavior of the Belarusian regime can be. Uh, we, we are still, at each every month, we are testing new lows uh, in, the, in the things that it's doing that are unacceptable uh, domestically and internationally. Uh, and finally, and, uh, and specifically to your point, watch how elites respond to that, because uh, Lukashenko is accelerating the country into a cul-de-sac now, and there are people around him who matter, who have to draw conclusions uh, for themselves and for uh, their country uh, about what uh, should be done about this. Nigel, thank you so much for your insightful thoughts, and I look forward to more Russia and Eurasia-related analysis from you on the podcast again soon. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. And thank you all for listening as well. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Please do follow, rate, and subscribe to Sun Strategic wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts to keep up to date with all the latest episodes. And for more in-depth analysis of the key international security and defense issues from around the world, be sure to follow the IISS on Twitter, LinkedIn, or visit the IISS website. Thank you and see you next time.